all came out with this lecture on Così fanno tutte in collaboration with Arizona Opera. This is the final work of our 2023 season and we are thrilled about it. My name is Helen Hendricks and I would like to start this with something very near and dear to my heart, a topic that I'm very passionate about. Myself. All right. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Helen Hendricks. I am a teaching artist here with Arizona Opera. And in that position, I am part of a troupe of four people that goes to predominantly Title I schools and performs adapted versions of Rossini's Cenorentola and Massenet's Cendrillon. These are both versions of the story Cinderella. And we have taken those two operas and combined them into a, a school-friendly opera that happens in about 30 minutes. We perform that for children. And then we also have two um, more lecture-style shows for our older students a lot of fun and uh, if you ever get a chance to see it I can't recommend it enough I recently graduated with a Bachelor of Music from ASU in 2021 so let's get into it all right I wanted to start you off with some opera basics so opera is one of the oldest forms of musical theater and it's an art form that spans back about 400 years it originates from a Greek form of theater in which actors would use special techniques to project their voices all the way to the backs of arenas so as you can imagine, that is a very far distance, so they really needed something that would cut through. Opera singers famously do not use microphones, and they spend years trying to learn how to effectively use their natural resonance. Did anyone here get a chance to see our most recent production of A Little Night Music? Oh, great. So if you saw that, you would have seen that the singers did use microphones, and that would be because that is an example of musical theater. But for our production, Cosi Fan Tutte, that is an opera, and so they will not be mic. So let's go over a bit of vocabulary. Um, so the overture is the orchestral piece at the beginning of an opera. In the overture, the composer introduces you to many of the most important melodies in the piece, and this is your time to just sort of sit back, relax, and get acquainted with the work. When you hear someone talk about an act, that is a major section of an opera. Cosi Fan Tutte is an opera in two acts. When we talk about a libretto, which we will talk about in this presentation today, we are talking about the text of an opera, and the plural of libretto is libretti, a little Italian lesson there. Now, we have an aria, which is the character's song, um, and then if you hear someone use the word ensemble, we are talking about a musical number where we have several characters singing together, but of course ensemble can also mean a group of musicians. So, cosi fan tutte. Now, I want you all to be able to pronounce this in the beautiful Italian. I don't want you in the lobby referring it to as cosi fan tutte. So, let's have a moment. Let's learn it. So, repeat after me. Cosi. cosi. Beautiful. Fan. fan. Mm -hmm. Tutte. tutte. Bravi. And we have that double T, that very Italian double T. Tutte. I couldn't have done it better myself. <laughs> All right, so La Scuola de Amanti. Uh, the colloquial title of this opera is Cosi Fan Tutte. And this title roughly translates to they're all like that, and that is in reference to women being fickle. So cosi meaning like so, fun being short for fanno, so like they make, they are, and tutte being all women. Um, but because the title doesn't really elegantly translate into English, we usually refer to it as cosi fan tutte, or just simply cosi. This is a little bit different. Um, some of Mozart's other De Ponte operas we refer to by their English titles, you know, Marriage of Figaro and uh, Don Giovanni, we just call Don Giovanni, but this one is cosi. Okay, so the second and lesser known title of this opera is La Scuola degli Amanti, which means the school for lovers. So the full title is Cosi fan tutte la scuola degli amanti. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a mouthful. So let's have a basic overview of the plot. So we begin with two soldiers, and they meet a man named Don Alfonso. And Alfonso makes a bet that their girlfriends will not remain faithful to them if they are deployed. And the men decide that they can very easily win this bet. I think it's like 100 gold pieces on the line or something. I know. Um, and so they decide to dress up in disguise to prove to Don Alfonso that the ladies will, in fact, remain faithful. And we find out if women are really all like that. All right, the plot. I have made this nifty little plot line if we have a nice throwback to our elementary school days. So here, at the beginning, we have Don Alfonso meeting the men and placing his bet. This is where we start the opera. This is how it opens. As we have this, the rising action, the soldiers don their disguises and try to seduce the women. 
Uh, and eventually the ladies do fall for their men and they decide that they will marry them. The men after the wedding ceremony decide to leave and then they return no longer in disguises and they kind of ask the girls, you know, what's, how's it been going? What have we been up to? <laughs> right, and then uh, in the end though, Don Alfonso does convince the men to forgive the two sisters. So an interesting bit about Cosi Fan Tutte is there's always this thing, do the lovers switch? So let's explain that. So you see this image uh, over here on this side. We have, so these are the, the lovers in their original pairs and when the men dress up to seduce the women, they switch because it might be a bit obvious if it was your boyfriend in disguise, but if it's your friend, you're not gonna notice apparently. Um, <laughs> so they switch. And so uh, what's interesting about this score is that Mozart at no point really um, says definitively if the couples switch back at the end or not. And so one way that directors like to play with this work and make it a little bit different is by, you know, playing with, with that trope. So you'll have to come to our production to see which one we go with. <laughs> All right, the setting of this opera. So it is set in Naples in Italy in the 18th century, the 1700s. And it's interesting that this opera is set in Naples because the, the rest of Mozart's operas that he did in collaboration with the Ponte are all set in Spain. And one of the reasons that historians think that this opera did not go over well with the public was because it was set just a bit too close to home for the audiences. And they had a hard time laughing at characters making mistakes when the characters reminded them so much of themselves. <laughs> okay, one of my favorite things about opera is recitative, and this is one of the most important factors. Uh, so a very special characteristic of opera that separates it from musical theater is the use of recit or recitative. Recit is when a composer will set dialogue to music in a way that mimics speech. Now, because they're meant to sound like talking, it can feel like it's going by quite fast, but that's all right. We have subtitles. In contrast, uh, arias will have longer melodic lines and they have a much fuller accompaniment from the orchestra. Arias also tend to last quite a bit longer than recitatives. I always like to say that arias are usually a character singing about a single emotion or event for an extended period of time, while recitative gives you expository narrative and really works to push the story forward. So let's have a quick example of recitative. All right, now for the rest of the team. So as we can see, this is really just a musical conversation. We hear the two characters going back and forth. Despina even has that like, oh, the ee in the, in the one point. So this is a perfect example of recitative and we can hear that the orchestra just kind of, it's more percussive. It's not a big lyrical accompaniment. It's just sort of guiding the singers along. <clears throat> All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Next up, we have different types of opera. So there are several types of opera. Did anyone here get a chance to see Carmen? Oh, good, okay, very nice. So if you saw that show, you would get a chance to see opera comique, which despite its title does not mean that the opera was comical, but rather refers to the fact that we have both recitative and spoken dialogue. So in Italy, while Cosi was being written, there were two main types of opera during that time. We have opera seria and opera buffa. So opera seria, seria meaning serious, uh, generally will feature famous historical figures or noble people. So these operas usually will cover a more tragic plot or serious topics, and they tend to be on the longer side, maybe about three to four acts. Then on the other hand, we have opera buffa, buffa meaning funny or comical, and this features common people, soldiers, innkeepers, um, farmers, and the like. And so this is going to cover lighter, funnier stories, and they tend to be on the shorter side. So an interesting thing about Cosi 
is that it's kind of a combination of both of these two types of opera, opera seria and opera buffa. And we'll talk about in a moment how this opera was received, but it's part of the reason that people didn't necessarily love it when it started. They were a bit confused. They didn't quite know what to make of it. So let's talk about the one, the only, Mozart. Born in 1756 and he passed in 1791. He was born in Salzburg. Mozart was very famously a child prodigy and he played in the courts of several prominent noble people. His father was a famous musician uh, and so was his sister, but she did not become nearly as famous as he did. Um, so one, he's one of the first musicians that didn't have to exclusively work for a church or a noble person. Bach famously worked almost for his whole career for the church. And Mozart is really the first example we have of a freelance musician. And this means that he got to do works that he found interesting and he got to take commissions based on what he wanted to do. So that's part of the reason that he probably wouldn't have been able to write Cosi if he was working for a native, uh, for a, a noble person, but he worked on commissions that he wanted to do, so he took it on. Next up, we have Da Ponte. Da Ponte is our librettist. Remember, we talked about libretto that is the text of an opera. So Mozart wrote the music, Da Ponte wrote the text. He was born in 1749 and passed in 1838. So Da Ponte uh, was actually not always a poet. He was born Jewish, but in his early childhood years, his father decided to convert to Catholicism, and as an adult, he decided to become a priest, but was thrown out of the brotherhood for having a mistress and living in a brothel. <laughs> and it didn't go over well, right, as we can imagine. So he met Mozart in the year 1783 when he was 34 years old and Mozart was 27, and by the time they started working together, Mozart had already written seven operas in Italian and three in German. Da Ponte has a total of 28 libretti written with 11 different composers, and this is a fact that I find very interesting, was in a long-term relationship with the original woman who played the role of Fior di Ligi, which is one of the two sisters in the show. And it should be noted that she has some of the most interesting text, but also the most text, and is the sister that takes the longest to uh, fall in love for her soldier in disguise. I wonder why. So let's talk about the libretto. Uh, the libretto of Cosi was originally offered to Salieri, who was a very famous composer at the same time, but he turned it down because he thought it was too simple. Um, people really kind of looked at this storyline like it was mm, like a soap opera, like how we kind of see those right now, where we're kind of like, oh, it's a little over dramatic. It's just not real enough for me. And so he turned it down, but Mozart was very excited about it. So, as I have said, the premiere was not initially successful. It premiered on January 26th in 1790 at the Berg Theater in Vienna. So, it is now a very famous opera, but it was not initially successful. And in fact, this opera didn't begin to rise in popularity until about the middle of the 20th century. The libretto was thought too simple, it was thought frivolous, and in an attempt to save the work, French musicians actually decided to reset it to Shakespeare's work, Love's Labor Lost, because they loved the music, they just really were not a fan of the storyline. So this is an actual review from the time, from the premiere of this. I will read it in my most dramatic voice possible. <clears throat> Everyone was astonished that this man could have demeaned himself to waste his heavenly melodies on such a worthless libretto. It did not, however, lie in his power to refuse the commission, and the libretto was specially provided. So, as we can see, it did not go over well. It was not a smash hit, unlike his other operas. The origins of the libretto. So, like I said, critics were really frustrated by this opera and they held Mozart in a high regard. They had really enjoyed several of Da Ponte's previous works. And so they didn't want society to hold this opera against either of the men. And for that reason, they really did their best to just sweep it under the rug and kind of pretend like it didn't happen. And so for that reason, we don't actually know the original inspiration of this libretto. They did not document that. Scholars have speculated that Da Ponte might have taken inspiration from old wives' tales, and one story famously states that it is actually based on a real story he heard about Viennese soldiers, but uh, there is absolutely nothing to suggest that that is true at all, but it's a fun story. Okay, so let's get into our characters. Now, you might remember Fior de Ligi, pronounced Fior di Ligi, say it with me, Fior de Ligi. 
bravi. Okay, this is a soprano role. A soprano is a high female voice. Fior de Rigi is a character that's serious, dramatic. She stays faithful to her man the longest, and she is a very good example of opera seria. So we will hear just a little bit of Fior de Rigi's aria, come scoglio, meaning like a rock. come to the opera, you can hear the whole thing. <laughs> All right, our next character up is Dorabella, pronounced Dorabella, double L, give it a go. <laughs> Lovely double L. All right, this is a mezzo-soprano role, which is a lower female voice. She is a younger sister, and she's less dramatic than, than uh, Fior de Ligi. But a fun fact is that in Mozart's day, we didn't really make as much of a distinction between mezzo-sopranos and sopranos. So this role was done by a lot of different women and a lot of different voice types. But nowadays, we really do consider Dorabella to be very much a mezzo-soprano role. Dorabella is the younger sister, and so she's much more laid back than Fior de Ligi. Her music will also mimic the melodies of the other characters around her. And Mozart does this on purpose to show us that she's not really a very strong character. And here we have one of our very own studio artists at Arizona Opera, Mac, singing uh, Dorabella's aria Smagne. Okay, so the next one we've got is Despina, pronounced Despina with a very closed, very bright E. So proud. All right, so this is another soprano, but this, unlike Fior de Ligi, is what we call a soubrette role, which is a much lighter voice. Uh, Despina is the maid, and she's a character that's silly, frivolous, comedic, and a very clear example of opera buffa. Now, singing Despina's aria in uomini, it's not other than your very own Helen Hendricks. Uh, in this aria, Despina talks about, she talks to the two women about, uh, in men, really, we will be placing our faith in men. Do we have a plan B? Fidelfa, 
very kind. Our next character up that we have is Ferrando, pronounced Ferrando, kind of an open O at the end. Give it a go. Very proud, you're going to impress a lot of people in the lobby. Okay, so he is our tenor, he's a soldier. Ferrando is kind, he's loving, he's friendly, he is very much our stereotypical tenor character. And here we have him singing his aria, Una Ora Amorosa. One of my favorites is very beautiful, isn't it? Next up, we have Guglielmo. This one's a little bit tricky, but just think of it as the Italian version of William, and I think you'll be all right. Guglielmo. Very nice. He is our baritone. He is another soldier. And Guglielmo is a contrast to the tenor. So just like the two sisters are kind of opposite each other, so are the men. So he's arrogant, confident, a bit cavalier. And here we have him singing his big aria, Donne mie le fatte tanti. And we want to go to three minutes and 20 seconds because that's where the magic happens. <laughs> Now, we might hear that his music really contrasts the tenor, right? The tenor was very sweet, and his is much more aggressive, and so this demonstrates uh, both of their characters. And we will also see that these costumes, if I can get this too close, this doesn't maybe look like what you would expect a soldier in Naples to be wearing, and that's because at this point they are in their disguises. And finally, we have Don Alfonso, pronounced Don, kind of like Dusk and Don, and then Alfonso. Mm. He is our base, sort of um, a philosopher. I don't know. It's not clear what he does, but he does uh, ask a lot of questions and stir up trouble, so it seemed fitting. He is our troublemaker. He's very confident, and a fun fact is that he really does not have a proper aria at any point, and so he uses mainly recitative to push the storyline along. So this is my favorite part of the presentation, contemporary casting, where I have cast this opera with contemporary actors so you can get a sense of kind of what they're like. So for Fiora de Ligi, we have Viola Davis because it's, she always does those very serious roles, those really, really strong women. And Fiora de Ligi needs to have some good acting chops. Next up, we have Dora Bella as Amy Adams because she's kind of the sweet best friend. She needs to have a serious acting moment now and then, but she just kind of has a sunny disposition. For Daspina, we have none other than Lucille Ball, because who better to stir up trouble and kind of be a little quirky? <laughs> All right, we've got the men now. For Ferrando, we have Chris Hemsworth, just kind of your 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 sweet, very lovable character. That's oh, I don't. That's what he always plays when I see him. We have Guillermo as Orlando Bloom, specifically because of his days in Pirates of the Caribbean. Then finally, for Don Alfonso. Who better to stir trouble up than the one, the only, 
Danny DeVito. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about the themes in Cozy. So the major theme in Cozy is love versus lust, but some people wonder if it's also a commentary on whether or not you can truly love someone and also have another lover on the side. Um, but this work really contrasts the difference, you know, between idealized notions of love and how love tends to play out in our, in our real lives on a daily basis. A question that almost any literature that you find on this work will, is, is, is it problematic? And yes, uh, Cozy is problematic, um, but so is real life. So during Mozart's day, the idea that women were all like that would have been very normal, and as much as I want this work to be ahead of its time, politically speaking, it really isn't. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't expect Mozart to have written an opera based on feminist theories and principles that did not yet exist. We were not talking about feminism in the 18th century, and this was really, this was a, a common reality for women of the 18th century. And so it's, it's also still a reality for today's women. And for this reason, I believe that we should still perform this work because it is relevant. Um, it's okay that sometimes you might feel a bit uncomfortable with how women are treated in this work. And this gives us an opportunity to really examine our feelings about how women are treated and the roles that female stereotypes play in our society. So Arizona Opera is aware that this work can be problematic and we are very excited to inform you that there is an all female creative team behind this production. And the team is working really hard to ensure that all of the women in this show are shown as real people with depth and substance. So here comes one of my other favorite sections, meet the gals. All right, we've got our conductor, Karen Kamensky, uh, Kamens, Kamensky? Thank you. Uh, she has had a huge international career, and she has worked all over the world. She has done a lot of work on both instrumental and vocal literature, so she is the perfect person to do this work for us. And she actually recently made her Met debut uh, just about a year ago in Akhenaten, so that is really an exciting person to have on the team. We have uh, E. Lauren Meeker, this is our stage director. She is the general director at Opera San Antonio and is also a dance and gymnastic uh, background and so she brings that into her staging. I am very excited to see it. Finally, we got um, uh, our, Haley is our assistant stage director. So she's Arizona Opera's first resident assistant director and she has a lot of experience with both new works as well as classic productions. And she has done a lot of work in the United States and also in England, which I think is very interesting. So let's talk about my tips on enjoying an opera. So step one is to know your libretto. So if you're familiar with what's going on in the plot, that's gonna allow you to spend less time reading and more time watching the actors. Opera is not like musical theater where you sit in your seat and they give you all of the information and you can come in with zero knowledge. It's not cheating to look at the plot before. It's good, it's doing your homework. Um, we are dealing with topics that are a little outdated and we might be dealing with jokes that are not common in society uh, at this point anymore. And so it is really helpful to know what is going on. My next suggestion is to listen to the repertoire. So it is even more exciting for me to go to an opera when I already know what's coming. I get to be excited and I, I get to look forward to what's next but you can still enjoy it if you're not familiar with the music. My final tip is to bring a friend. Opera is a wonderful solo activity, but one of my favorite parts is talking about it during intermission with the people I've brought with me. And then just a little bit of etiquette at the opera because I don't want you to feel out of place at any point. So do clap for performers. It's a live, a live sport. And we love to hear you, we love to know you're there. So say bravi, bravo. Do unwrap your breath mint before we begin, please. And do arrive early. Uh, maybe don't talk during the performance, but intermission is a great time for that. Do not forget to turn your phone completely off. And also please don't record or take photos. So here I have some free resources that I've put together. This is just a very uh, simple Google document. So if you would like to scan this, you may, and it'll just take you to some articles that I found uh, really interesting about this. And then I'll go back to this in just a moment so you can all scan it. So thank you so much for listening to this lecture today. Um, I think we have some time for questions, correct? Yes, so I will go back to this. You can scan that. Anyone have questions? Oh, sure. 
Am I going to be performing? No, I will not be performing, but there is a really exciting cast. A lot of our studio artists are in this production, as well as previous studio artists. Um, we have some people that placed really high in the Met competition in previous years, so it is really a great group of singers. Right, so we do offer those. I personally am not the one um, doing that, but they do offer a really wonderful pre-show lecture, if you'd like to go about that. I think you can find more information about that on our website, or you can talk to one of these lovely gals in the back at the table, and they can help you. Okay. All right, any final questions? Yeah? Yeah, Oh, that's a good question. Um, right now, I am an opportunity artist at Arizona Opera, like I talked about, so we do the school shows. Um, I do have a private studio, so I do teach. Um, and I hope to be doing more performing in the future. Things are starting to open back up, so there's more opportunities. Um, and I would love to just sing full time. That's the dream. Mm -hmm. Three hour 45? Yeah. Two. Three hours. Three hours, okay. With a 30 minute intermission. All right, well, if that's all the questions we have, thank you so much for coming. We're so glad you came out today.